Good morning. Can I welcome everyone to the 13th meeting of the Education and Skills Committee in 2018? And can I please remind everyone present to turn their mobile phones and other devices onto silent for the duration of the meeting? The first item of business is a decision on whether to take Agenda Item 4 in private. Is everyone content to take Agenda Item 4 in private? Thank you. The next item of business is an evidence session on the attainment and achievement of school-aged children experiencing poverty inquiry. This is the third evidence session of the inquiry, and this week we have a focus on primary school-aged children. Can I welcome to the meeting Nancy Clooney, Head Teacher, Domarnock Primary School, Kirsten Hogg, Head of Policy, Bernardos, Sawa Ryman, Director, One Parent Family Scotland, Brian Scott, Commissioner of Poverty Truth Commission, and Chelsea Stinson, Children's Voices, the Programme Manager, Children's Parliament. Welcome. I should say to the panel from the outset that if you'd like to respond to a question, please indicate to me or the clerks and I will call you to speak. And don't feel the need for everybody to respond to every question. Uh, feel free to do so if you wish, but don't feel that, that, that you have to. For the benefit of those watching, I should explain that the committee held an informal meeting, formal meeting with parents, teachers and other professionals on this, on this topic earlier this morning. Can I thank all who attended the session, some of who are in the audience watching the formal session. Yesterday, Liz and Ruth and I visited Queen Anne High School in Dunfermline, and I should put on record my thanks to everyone at the school who made us very welcome. The school has several really interesting projects, one of which was a swap shop that the anti-poverty group at the school had started. The pupils washed and ironed the clothes that, they were, that were handed in and made them available for anyone who needed them. They had also thought very hard about how people would feel about having second-hand clothing and accessing swap shops, so they made it something that was literally a swap shop that you either made a donation or you handed in a bit of clothes so no child felt as if they were getting a handout. Uh, it was great to speak to the young people who'd approached the issue so sensitively. But how do we make sure that state interventions like free school meals, etc., are as easy to access for our families and young people? Uh, to, uh, to make sure that that stigma doesn't follow them. That, does anybody like to respond to that? It's going to be the shortest meeting on record. I'm quite pleased with this. Yeah. Okay, Chelsea. Yeah. Um, I think for the children that we spoke to in the child poverty consultation, stigma was a big thing that they raised around access to free school meals or receiving any other kind of benefits and support. And so I think there's something that needs to be done in terms of making sure that children don't feel that as a continuing thing as they grow up, because um, it's something that they raise quite quite frequently across the work that we do. Um, so what can be done, I don't have an answer to that necessarily, but it's something that children are identifying at even a young age, that there is some sort of stigma that is following them if they are accessing any kind of support and benefits. Thank you very much. Stella? Just really following on from that, I mean, stigma is something that many of the families that we work with have spoken to in terms of accessing services. I mean, one of the things we heard earlier in um, the session with, with parents and professionals was how sometimes the systems we set up to try to make it easier for ourselves act as barriers for those who are trying to access the services. And the example that was given was of the sort of digital first, the online systems for um, paying for school meals or even choosing your child's school meals if they're on free school meals. So you'd think a system like that, that's separate from the actual availability of the food in school would mean that it should address the stigma, but not if it in, um, results in digital exclusion for those families and they were unable to, a whole series of them were unable to go online and to be able to do that. And one of the um, people earlier from um, a school in Nidri spoke about how they had drop-in sessions for parents to be able to come and do that. But I think there is something about when we're designing the systems which we think will address stigma yeah. and stop singling people out, we're doing it with the people and not for or on behalf of them. And therefore, there's all these unintended consequences that we don't see. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Does anybody else have any comments? In, in terms of stigma for families, what we've also found to be really successful is where um, a family can build up a relationship with someone that they really trust, um, with our family support workers, for example, um, where that person can help them to open up to say, actually, I'm, I, don't think I've, I, I don't think I'm accessing the right benefits. I don't think um, I've got the right furniture in my house um, for my child. I don't, I, these are really difficult things for families to say, to admit that actually, um, if they feel that they're going to be judged for that, 
um, that's a very difficult thing to open up and say, and that can be very difficult for them then to access the right support to, to, to get those benefits and to help them access that. So sometimes this is a really long game. Um, so we're going in and we're building up a relationship with a family for one reason, um, but then through building up that relationship and them feeling that they won't be judged by that worker, that they can trust them, that that's somebody who's really there to help them and support them, um, they'll feel able to ask us to help them with those sorts of issues as well. So sometimes it's about giving someone space to say, actually, I, I need some help with that, and then knowing that we'll be able to support them. Uh, Brian and then Lance. Yeah, as well as being a commissioner for the Poverty Truth Commission, I'm actually the parent of two children. One is at a primary school in a deprived area. And actually, I, I know firsthand what poverty is like. I agree with the statements before, stigma is a big thing. Also, the, I've encountered this underlying discrimination for example, they take, some teachers assume that all children have access to a computer. If they put activities online, then they assume they can go home and they've got tablets, phones, whatever. Most children do, but a few children don't. And they're left out and they're stigmatised and they're kind of pointed out and it's made aware within the classroom because they can get punishment exercises which I've heard about because they've not handed in homework uh, tasks because they couldn't get access to a computer. Also, the school that my youngest boy goes to has got a high immigrant community and quite a few of the parents there do not have access to computers and if they did, there's difficulties using it. So that I would just ask that assumptions aren't made. It's that we're in a technical age which is great if you can afford to take part in it. But if you don't have the means, you sometimes feel like an outcast because you're outside the system that everyone has access to. And that's a source of stigmatisation and a source of embarrassment. And if you're a parent that can't provide the relevant technical access, computer access, then it's the sense of failure you have as well. And it's adding more pressure onto you. I'd just like to point that out. I think that's a fair point. It used to be trainers, and now it seems to be smartphones and things like that. There's always something they're trying to... Go back to the school meal. Um, within my own school, there, there is no stigma um, about the, for the children who receive the meal. In fact, it, it almost works in reverse. Um, children who pay are, are saying, how do we get a ticket? But I think it's exactly what Kirsten said. Um, I've been there a long time. So it's about relationships. Um, we have 42 different languages spoken in the school. So many of the parents struggle to fill in any forums. So straight away, we'll sit down with them. Um, and also many of the parents struggle with forums full stop. So it, it's because we have that relationship with parents that they know that they can come and, and that we're not judging them, that we help them fill in the form, we'll write the envelope, we'll send it off for them. Um, but I do think a huge bonus has been the um, free school meals from P1 to 3 and Glasgow going up to P1 to 4 because if it's free for everyone, then the stigma has gone and I think that's a, a huge thing um, and that will certainly help. Yeah. OK, thank you. Uh, I'll move on now to Mary. Thank you, and, and good, good morning, panel. Um, I want you to explore in a bit more detail the issue of the financial assistance that's available um, to, to young people. Um, and I, I'd be keen to hear your kind of general thoughts on how the support is accessed and, it, and is it directed in, in the right ways? Before I go on to specifically ask about educational maintenance allowance and, and the clothing grant, do you think that there's the right package of measures there to support people? The one thing I'd say about the clothing grant, within the Poverty Truth Commission, there's a subgroup that was, that's looking into this. And what they found that, excuse the, the, the pun, but the uniform grant and the clothing grant isn't anything but uniform across Scotland, where there's a vast difference between different local authority areas. Uh, I don't understand and why. I know that the local authorities in general are responsible for setting the, the, the uniform grants, but why is there such a discrepancy? Why can't 
the Scottish Parliament or a subgroup or whatever come together and say a blazer, a pair of trousers costs the same in Orkney as it does in, say, Octonocty. Why suddenly the, the Orkney Council can be sometimes up to £50 a difference to another local authority? Why, why is it not just uniform across the board? But, uh, but, but do you think part of the difficulty around that is, um, while I accept that a pair of trousers might cost the same in, um, in the south of Scotland as, as they, they do in the north, uniform is not the same. It's not uniform across across the country because there are different badges. Some blazers have got to be braided. Some have got to have caps. There's lots of different things that affect the, the, what There's uniform the, is to be worn. Yeah, the, I agree with you there. One, why don't school... I know of one school that seems that every couple of years they change their badge or change the colour of the blazers, etc. So that means a whole new outfit. On the whole, schools tend to go in for all-in-one units, where it's the, the jumper with the badge on it, it's the T-shirt with the badge on it, it's the jacket with the badge on it. And in Glasgow, there's the part I come from, there's only one shop you can go to, which is very expensive. It would be a lot easier if, if schools wanted to change, instead of buying the whole outfit, T-shirt, blazer, etc., why don't they have some facility where you can just buy the badge. So you can go to a shop where a blazer can cost £12 as opposed to £30 from the uniform shop that has the badge already on it. Or have the badge and, in consultation maybe with clothing manufacturers, have a pocket where you can put the badge in, a transparent pocket. It makes it a lot easier. If you've got a few kids at school, then that is a massive pressure on your budget and in your finances to try and go out at the start of a new term to change everything again. You can't even hand the clothes down if you've got children of different ages. If they, the school decides to change the colour or whatever, then that negates the possibility of handing it down. Some schools uh, in the area have started up uniform clubs where parents who can't afford the uniform, there's always a stock of uniforms that are handed in from uh, pupils who have moved on to other schools. But it's always something I could never understand, why they don't just have the badge that you can buy, so that then it's up to the parent to buy the blazer, whatever they want. They're not kind of straight jacketed into going to the one shop that has them and they're thirty pounds each. So I mean do, do you think the schools could do more to be um less rigid in, in where the uniform needs to come from? And do you I mean is the clothing grant easy enough to apply for? If English is your first language I would say yes. And it's good to hear Nancy say that Nancy yeah. made about helping Yeah. I mean, is, is applying for the clothing grant an issue in, in, in your school? The, the forum for free school meals and clothing grant is the it's same, the same forum. forum. It's the same forum. Um, so you complete exactly the same information. It goes into headquarters and they mm -hmm. decide, depending on your band and which grant you're mm -hmm. given. Um, the forum isn't particularly friendly. It's very small print. There isn't an awful lot of information required. Um, but you do need a bank account. And for some of our parents, that's been the struggle, although credit unions are now being accepted and that's huge in our, in our area and that's a great um, way forward for us. Again, I can only speak for my own. We keep uniform as simple as possible. Our parents are very keen on it. It's something that we ask regularly. Um, we have dropped the polo shirts with the badge. If the parents want it, they can still order it, but we don't sell it. We sell it cost price, whatever the, the company charges us. So a sweatshirt is £6.50 with the badge on it. Um, and we sell it for exactly that. Um, but as I say, we've dropped the polo shirts because you can go to the, the local supermarket and get two for three pounds. And if you're wearing your sweater, the badge is covered. So I don't see the need for a, an expensive polo the, the shirt. The issue with the forum being perhaps slightly overcomplicated, is that a view shared by the, 
the, the rest of the panel that the, the, the form itself could be made more more simple in the way you have to fill it in. That, that's certainly the feedback we've had from groups of single parents we've been working with in Glasgow to look to see what would be the barriers to you being able to access um, this funding. It's been the form, it's been the lack of a bank account as well. And we did do a piece of work in Glasgow to look to see whether low-income families could automatically receive a school cloth a clothing grant if we can find a way. So much information is required from families by so many different parts of a local authority. If we can find a way of having an integrated system whereby there's the one, you know, um, the one door entry point, which then passports them onto all these things without having to go through a series of hoops. That's one of the things that's fed back to us time and again, together with the fact of if we could look at something similar to what's going to be happening, with, for example, the Best Start grant. Whether, you know, I mean, a lot of families say, yes, we get the school clothing grant, we buy what we need to, but actually, we need to keep replacing things. You know, I've got an example here. My daughter rips a pair of tights at school every day. Six pounds for a pack of free tights times 32 weeks in the year is not cheap. Outdoor and indoor gym kit. School uniform is a kilt, not cheap. Went through four pairs of shoes and boots already since August. It's an ongoing cost for families. It's not a one-off cost. And that's something we need to be looking at in the system for this grant. How quickly does the grant come through after... You... I wanted to ask about EMEs as well. <laughs> Very briefly. Okay. Okay. We'll spend some time on this one. Okay. How quickly does the grant come through? It varies, and that's one of the other things that people talk about in terms of the amount of time it can take from application to actually receiving the money. It really varies from area to area. And, um, and use my, my last question to ask about um, EMEs. And I'd be interested in, um, in the, panel's, the panel's views on, on whether the level of education maintenance allowance is actually the right amount what the uptake is amongst particularly um, one-parent families. And I'd be interested in Bernardo's view, um, if, if they have done any work on the uptake of EME amongst children that are care-experienced, um, and the situation around um, kinship care arrangements, because there are some um, fixed kinship care, regulated kinship care um, arrangements, but there are also some kind of, shall we say, looser kinship care um, arrangements. We answer that, given it's basically for secondary as opposed to yeah. primary, but uh, if anybody feels that they, they can respond then. Very quickly. I can get back to you on the figures. I don't have them to hand with the EMA uptake among single parent families. I mean, one of the issues though, that families have spoken about in some areas, you don't, if you get the EMA, you stop getting the school clothing grant. You know, and I think that is something that needs to be looked at because it shouldn't be either or. That's good, thank you. Yeah, Brian. Yeah, also the. I've heard stories within the PTC where there's a problem in the transition when you, from child tax credit onto the EMA, where it's not a smooth transition and it can be a source of great, great worry. Because the, the two systems don't seem to be linked up, they don't seem to coordinate with each other, and it's left to the parent to try and sort things out. Uh, and there has been cases where parents have got into debt because there's no transfer of information or it's not a, a smooth transition and all of a sudden you get the bill from something like child tax credit because your child has done this and has changed in circumstances, you know you owe us X amount. And if you know of anybody that does that, that they get in touch with the, the, the local representative mm -hmm. to take their case up because that sounds as if it's completely unfair and unjust. Yeah. Hey, Ross. Uh, convener. Um, Nancy, I'd just like to come back to the point you made around um, free school meals and the difference that's made uh, universal uh, free meals between primary one and three and, and up to four in, in some local authorities. Do you notice a, a difference then when the children move past the age at which it's universal? Um, are there challenges that were being resolved by the universal provision of free school meals that begin to emerge later in a child's time at school when it's no longer universal? The biggest challenge is, is making sure that the children who are entitled to free school meals when just now they hit P4 and in future when they hit P5 is making sure that their parents have submitted the paperwork in good time because there can be a gap and in that time the parents have to pay until, it, until it's passed and quite quickly their debt can, can rack up and parents will say, oh, but I thought they were getting free so, you know, we start saying to parents, March, 
although it will not stop till August to try and get the paperwork in, um, that that can be the biggest stumbling block. In terms of children eating, we do have some children further up the school who you'll say, I didn't see you in the lunch hall, not many, but I didn't see you in the lunch hall today. And they will say, we don't have money. My mum doesn't have money. That's OK, Miss Clooney's got money. Come. So nobody in our school goes hungry. Um, but there are some children who will say quietly to us, you know, my mum said I can't go to school lunches today. There's no money. Um, and I'm not entitled to a free school meal. Well, there's always food in Domarnock. But as I say, the biggest stumbling is... is parents understanding that they need to complete this forum um, because they're so used to now it being free and, and they can quickly come into debt and that's something that we never want to see. And the, the breakfast club at, at your school, I'm interested, does that, is there an interaction there between that and, and the provision of free school meals and are you able to, to engage with families more if they're engaging with the breakfast club to ensure that they are taking up an entitlement they have to the free lunch as well? Is, is there an interaction between the two? Or? Not particularly. Our breakfast club um, some mornings isn't greatly attended. Um, on the mornings that we have support from one of our local partner agencies peak, then the numbers soar. But we have such good relationships, um, like my parents' mammy, you know. So you're in the playground, you're in the yard, you're having wee quiet words, pick up the telephone, um, and if we think that there's problems, then it, it's the face-to-face -face chat. Um, but it's about relationships, and quite often the school work comes home because we need to do all of this, and this is so important. Um, in the consultation that we delivered with children on child poverty, food was something that came up repeatedly. So access to breakfast or to school dinners um, or to being able to bring lunch with them. Um, and it's also something that children identified as impacting on their attainment. So going hungry in the mornings or throughout the school day has an impact on their ability to focus um, and their kind of worry and stress levels as well. And just to note that we are actually currently um, doing a consultation on school food for the new regulations. And we're actually in Dalmarnock today. Um, so my colleagues are. So this is something that we'll be coming back to as well in, in a report in the future as well. So what kind of prevents children from taking up yeah, breakfast clubs or free school meals within their school, um, whether that's a cost or just kind of the, the quality of the food or whatever it might be. Um, so that will be coming out in the next couple of months as well, the work that we're doing. Um, so, yeah. Thanks. We had a, a very interesting example in the, the informal session next door of um, income maximisation uh, work in schools and the impact that has on families. So I'm interested in, in this issue of the, the wider financial support that's available um, and what kind of difference that, that makes. Are, does, does anyone have any examples of where the income maximisation support has taken place within schools or where schools have been used to build that relationship with families and the kind of impact that it's had? Uh, during our summer schools, um, we opened the school for the last two, three years. We've opened a school in the summer um, for parents and children because I don't do childcare, so you have to come with your mum or your dad or your granny. And we never wanted it to be a lecture, so we brought in people to have coffee with parents and, and to initiate conversations. But we did bring in people to talk about things like that, and that certainly the parents look forward to and now ask can we have um, people back who can support us to we make sure that we're getting the benefits that we're entitled to but it's done on an informal basis you can engage if you wish no one is forcing you to do it um, but it has certainly helped and, and parents will tell us that 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 was very helpful yeah uh, i'd like Kirsten, do you want to come in here and then so we'll often look at income maximisation, but as part of a wider picture, because looking at income by itself is a really great step forward for families. Um, and it can often make a really transformative difference, as we heard this morning, but by itself is not enough. Um, so in our consultation response, we've um, given a case study of a family where actually the issue that presented to us was about non-attendance at school. It wasn't about um, income. Um, but as we started to work with that family and as we unpicked that, we discovered that part of um, mum's mental health problems 
problems, part of her anxiety was exacerbated by the financial difficulties that they had, the fact that she was a carer for her mum, she wasn't able to work because of that. Um, and so we worked with them on that income maximisation, and I think that's incredibly important. Um, but it's got to be as part of a, a, a look at the whole family situation. And um, so what, what else is the impact of that of that financial difficulty that that family's in? It's not only that they don't have enough to eat, and that's incredibly important both for the child, um, but also for the, for the family, because if a child is coming to school not eating, then the chances are incredibly high that the rest of that family is not eating either. We often hear from families where um, mum only eats Monday to Friday, she doesn't eat at the weekend because she wants to make sure that her kids have got enough. So, where we're looking at interventions with children, let's also think about what else is happening back within their home because the levels of stress, um, the, the impact that those things have on the rest of the family, then knock on to the child um, and their, their attachment relationships, the levels of stress that the child is experiencing. So, yes, let's do those things, but let's try to look at everything in the round within that family. Is that what you want to do? I'm just going to um, concur with that and say that actually that was exactly what I was going to say, that you need to take a family-based approach to look at what the issues are that are affecting the family. And also where the family feel most comfortable receiving that sort of support and advice. And usually it is some of them may feel less comfortable going into a school to have that. So it really is about finding the right place. And I think this is where you need the third sector and others as the intermediaries, as the ones who have got the informal relationship with the family, the one that's not on a statutory basis. And quite often, as um, Kirsten said, it's other issues that families present with. And it's when you begin to unpick those, you begin to see actually as a result of all these things, there's a family who's built up tens of thousands of pounds worth of debt. That's one of the things we need to deal with first before we can start to look at how we actually engage in doing the therapeutic work with the family because they need to be in a place where you can do that and so where the parent is then able to support the child. So I think it is very, very important to take that sort of holistic family view with income maximisation as part of it. And in Falkirk, we get lots of referrals from the schools we work with, but the work takes place in our family centre, where the families have been used to coming since their children were two, and have a relationship with the workers where they can be more honest and feel that they're not going to be judged. And I think that's really important. We've spoken about stigma a lot. What we need to make sure is that all the interventions are non-stigmatising. Um, I thought it was interesting in the notes for today about the mention of in investment in family stress models of poverty, and that's something that the children that we spoke with identified really naturally as well, and they talked about um, poverty feeling like a weight on their shoulders, something that they carried with them through their home life, through school, and as they progressed through life as well. Um, and so it's being aware that that's something that is going to impact on every aspect of life, um, and they were very aware of the stress that was happening in their families and how that impacted on the relationships that they, that they had with their parents, their siblings, and their wider network of support as well, as well as other peers within school and teachers and, and things like that. So I think it was that they're highly aware of what's going on in their homes and the, the impact that poverty does have on on their lives. Okay. Yeah. Brian, you wanted to come? Yeah, I agree with what Chelsea says. The, the overall stress levels in the family has a great impact on the children. I, my experience of, is that children take the problems on themselves. Uh, they try to find a solution for the problem, and sometimes the, the child even blames themselves for the problem. Overarching, whether it's in poverty or in benefits or whatever, is mental health issues mm -hmm. because the system is set up that actually puts in the pathway to mental health problems because it's so confusing and it's so dehumanising. So if the parents are under stress, then it is going to be picked up by the child. And I, what I found is a child's natural response is to find a solution. And they take the weight of that on themselves. So they're going to take that into school. They're going to take that into relationships with friends. And that's going to impact the child's own mental health. There's a syndrome that someone mentioned within the Poverty Truth Commission called the Brown Envelope Syndrome, that when you see the brown envelope come through the door, you panic because you know that it's from a benefits agency. Or if you're in poverty through, uh, through debt, then every letter that comes through that door is a demand. Every phone call that comes in is a demand. And that's going to put such stress and pressure on the parents. If there's two parents involved, stress in their relationship, the child is going to pick it up and 
I can see why they, they express it as a weight on their shoulders because that's exactly what it is. Just when Nancy was saying as well that bringing in other organisations to help sit down with the parents and maybe help them out their financial situation and maximise their financial uh, possibilities. Just then I thought I've worked with an organisation called Christians Against Poverty, which are a debt management agency. I just wonder if something like an agency like that could be invited in and when the, the parents feel comfortable they could access that service. It's a, a non-profit. That's, that's for you to maybe suggest to the, the, the schools in, yeah, yeah. yeah Organisations like that. Uh, OK, uh, sorry, are you finished, Ross? Yes, yes, thank you very much. Richard? Uh, thank you and welcome to the committee. <clears throat> Understandably, much of the conversation so far and the evidence from this morning has been about how to respond to the experience of poverty in our schools. And I would like to maybe explore a bit more what actually poverty means for learning, because the title of our inquiry is actually Impact of Poverty in School Attainment and Achievement. So I'd like to perhaps get some views on what it actually means for learning and for closing the attainment gap. And Nancy Cleary, I don't know how long you've been teaching for, how many years, but clearly uh, you seem like an experienced teacher. And therefore, can you... Pardon? For. Oh, does the word you're looking for? <laughs> that word doesn't exist in my vocabulary when it comes to speaking to witnesses at the committee. Uh, so perhaps you can reflect on your experience of what it actually means for children turning up to school who are experiencing poverty in terms of learning and what the recent trends have been in your experience as a teacher. I've been teaching a long time. This is me now into my 40th year. And I, I've seen huge changes. Things got really better for a long, long time and, and I see things going back to, to maybe along the lines of when I first started. One of the things that we're finding is people are, are being so careful. They have to be so careful that there's lack of opportunities um, the experiences that children are having are much more limited. Um, thinking back to when I first started teaching, schools made up for some of this. You took the children out as often as you could and it was three to a seat. It was long before seat belts and things. And, and if you had infants, it was four to a seat, so one bus, you know, and away we went. Thank goodness things have become much more safety conscious, but that also has a cost implication. Um, I've taught in lots of authorities and I was really pleased when I came back to Glasgow to find that they offer coaches for free if we're going to a Glasgow City Council um, resource. So it has allowed us to take the children out and about, but you're still limited. Um, so, you know, my children are being faced with texts talking about farms or the seaside and many of them have never experienced it. One wee boy in primary seven said to me last year, Miss Clooney, what is the sea? You know, and you're saying, oh, it's a bit, bit of water. And, um, and it was nothing. So we went straight upstairs and we booked a bus and we took the kids. Now, it was to Lunderston Bay. And for those of you from down the water, you'll know that that's the river. But for that child, it was the sea and it might only be the only chance he's got. So I feel, you know, children are watching TV, they're, they're computer savvy, they're being presented with this wonderful world, um, but they've not got real experience of it. And that was another reason that we opened summer clubs and for parents, because we take them places, but the parents are taking the children. We take a back seat on these trips because we want them to build memories, good memories, as a family, you know, do you remember that we went there? Um, but it allows the children when they come back to have cuddled a bunny rabbit or climbed a mountain or whatever it happens, throwing stones into the River Clyde because it's these kind of things that are missing, but they're expected to know that when they're reading a text to, to understand things that they've never experienced. And it's very difficult. Schools um, now, fortunately have, have got that little bit extra that we can help out. But for a long time, it was very difficult. Um, and 
the schools that I've worked in, money for parents I have never charged for a thing uh, for anybody. But you were limited in, in what you could do. And that's where I think children are missing out. Um, so hope that's helped answer some of your question. Yep, and if anyone else wants to come in in terms of what it actually means for learning. Me first. Um, <clears throat> when we spoke about poverty and how it impacted life at school, the children talked about a lot of the things that they were that were difficult to get. So material things, so things like uniforms, um, food, school bags, stationery, all the things that would help them. Um, and they also spoke about the, the lack of internet um, and connectivity, and so being unable to do homework at, at home when it was assigned and needing internet. Um, but they also talked about the, the possibility of children who are experiencing poverty being absent a lot from school. So again, that will have a, a direct impact on attainment just by not being present in the school, in the school day. Um, and they also brought up quite regularly the kind of access to school trips and residentials and how important those are to their school lives and their social lives and, and feeling quite embarrassed or left out um, and disappointed that they're not able to attend those opportunities like their peers are. And um, in the work that we've been doing in Aberdeen around doing our best, one of the things that we, we that came out quite strongly was kind of a poor learner self-perception. So this idea that if you're coming from a disadvantaged background, there are kind of lower aspirations or expectations on those children. Um, so helping children understand what their skills are, what their interests are, how they learn best in order to kind of help them feel positive about their learning. But there was a real kind of lower self -perception, learner self-perception in these schools who are attainment challenge schools. Um, so helping children kind of raise those aspirations I think is really important as well and how we see them and what their possibilities are. Um, I was just going to really add to that. I mean, there's, I think the way we need to look at it is, is in terms of poverty, there's the causes of it, which is the stuff that we've been looking at trying to address, either through income maximisation, looking at how we reduce costs, but looking at some of the other policy areas which will impact on this, like um, access to childcare, which the parents spoke about in the informal session, and um, the sort of family friendly. So, so, so there's a macro stuff, which is about tackling some of the causes. And in terms of the effect, the sorts of things that the families have spoken to about, us about is not being able to be involved in things is about not having a, not feeling that you can send your children to school ready to learn because you haven't been able to provide the breakfast for them or whatever and things like that. But one of the biggest things that they've spoken about, and this is about being part of a school community, that the family feels part of a school community and about being involved in things, is the hidden costs of um, some of the things. And I'm just going to, in, in the evidence, which I'm afraid you only got yesterday, and apologies for that, there's a family's experience where the parent was told, who has four children attending a local primary school, she was told on a Thursday, before the long weekend school break, the children were to dress up in the colours of the African flag. As she did not have the appropriate clothes, she would have to take her six children, including two high school pupils, on the bus into town. The T-shirts would cost £8. However, the bus fares would have cost £22.50. And then on top of that, you've got additional lunch costs because it becomes a day trip when you're having to do something like that. That would be at least £14. So buying the required items would therefore have cost her £58.50. And this is a parent on benefits. On top of this, the children are asked to pay a pound for the privilege of wearing the T-shirts, which is an additional £4. So in terms of what it means, it means those very practical things which are going to not make you feel part of a school community or make you feel different when you're going into one, and which is immediately going to impact on how engaged you're going to be for learning, let alone whether you're going in hungry. So there's a very practical things we need to look at, getting the conditions right, so that when the children are in class, they're in a state where they can learn. And I think if we're wanting to look at addressing the poverty-related attainment gap, we have to look at addressing poverty. And you want to come in and then finish with costs? Yeah, I agree with all that. Hidden costs to the schools in my area, it's not so much paying for the privilege of wearing a particular style of dress or whatever, it's to have non uniform days, which is a pound, and they're usually they burn monthly. But if you've got a few kids, it's the same school, is expensive. There's other things as well that can affect your education if you're suffering from poverty. If you have to rely on a school bus to take you to school, 
then very rarely is there any possibility of travel after the school day is done, which means you can't get access to like homework clubs and the other after school activities. If you have to leave the school to go to an appointment and you're relying on the bus, the chances are you won't go back to school after it because it's the cost of the bus fare there and the bus fare for the parent back. If the child is sick and you're phoned up as a parent to go and pick your child up, if you don't have access to a car, then you've got the bus fares to get there, then the bus is for you and the child back. And these are things that, if you're on benefits or a really tight budget, soon rack up and can really eat into what your affordability for buying things that week. Or, like you said, they do special projects, and you have to go out and sit at Christmas time where they have the activity place. Your child is an angel, right? You need to wear white, white T-shirt. You need to wear long uh, white clothing or you have to wear a specific type of clothing. You have to go out and buy it. It's expensive. And going back to the earlier subject where you're talking about mental health issues, where these things can have an impact on the mental health of the children. There's been occasions where children have been sent home because they're not wearing the appropriate uniform because the parent just couldn't afford it. And that has an impact on education. If they're coming from a background where there are stresses and strains due to poverty, they can manifest in the children through misbehaviour at school, which can lead to exclusions, which affects the education. My experience of schools that are in areas where there are large amounts of poverty is there seems to be such pressure on the budgets and there's extra demands on the school where they may have a large immigrant community so they've got to try and uh, find funding for the, the translators there's the children that have got additional needs so they're trying to f have think, a psychological help there with maybe child psychologists coming in and there's overcrowding issues as well uh, which from what I can see, it means that it's very difficult for a teacher to give the time to that's, that's needed by the people. Uh, yeah, I'll let you back in, Nancy, because I thought you wanted to come on that point. Uh, again, I can only speak for my own authority, Glasgow, but we've done, as an authority, a lot of work on the cost of the school day, and it's something that, as head teachers, we must do every year with our staff as part of our in-service day, because it, as you say, Brian, it's things like bringing white tights. You know, somebody can say that and thinking it's a pair of white tights, but they don't understand the impact. So it's something that, as a head teacher, I'm very conscious of, and we address constantly with the staff. Um, and I'd like to think that the whole of Scotland was addressing that in, in their schools, because, it really shouldn't be happening, at least in classical schools, that's for sure. Thank you, Kirsten. Just to say that in addition to those sort of reasonably practical things which are a barrier to learning and to attainment, um, I think it's really important to recognise that health and wellbeing really underpins a child's ability to learn and underpins the whole attainment agenda. Um, so we pushed quite hard um, in the framework for measuring the attainment gap within Scotland to have additional health and wellbeing measures in there. Um, not a super easy thing to measure, but if we take our eye off that ball, if we only look at literacy and numeracy and not the health and wellbeing pillar um, of education in Scotland, which is incredibly important, um, then we miss something there. And the impact of poverty on that um, is undeniable. So we know more than ever now about the impact on brain development of living in a very high stress environment. Um, that's not making any judgments about a parent or their ability to parent. But if your parent is very stressed, you are very stressed, that impacts on your ability to learn and on your brain development. Um, if your attachment relationship with your family is disrupted because you live in this very high stress environment, because your parent is m worried about where your next meal is going to come from or whether they can heat your house, um, then that's going to impact on your ability to learn. So as well as th those um, sort of day-to-day -day aspects that are a barrier to attainment, there's also a, a deeper issue around health and wellbeing that it's really important to recognise the impact of. OK, thank you. I'm going to let Ro uh, Richard back in, but before I do, can I just say that we've got a lot to go through now, so if we could all sort of keep our answers much shorter, that would be very, very appreciative. Richard. 
<clears throat> you don't all have to answer this question, but in terms of the fact it's now 2018, and it's disappointing to say the least that we are now talking about poverty again and the impact on the attainment gap. And if anything, the impression is that poverty is just as great an issue as it was perhaps a few years ago. So I'd like to ask you why you think that's the case and what you feel the trends are in terms of poverty. So I'm not talking about the symptoms of poverty, I'm talking about the causes of poverty. The system, if you're on benefits, the system is not geared towards the person's having to claim, and it's dehumanising. Also, as well, it's going to put stresses on the family, where you've got the new changes in the welfare benefits. They're rolling out universal credit soon. Uh, in Glasgow, it's going to be at the end of the year. That is going to cause great problems, because it's going to be a five-week period where there'll be no money at all. So that's going to put extra pressures on the family. Very quickly, I'd say if we were looking at what's causing the increase in poverty, we need to look at the changes that have taken place in benefits and welfare reform. We need to look at the increase in casualised um, employment, um, zero hours contracts. So there's a whole series of interrelated things that are actually leading to the increase in poverty. And actually, we work with single parents. 37% of all children in Scotland living in poverty live in a single parent family. And actually the worriest thing is that the Equality and Human Rights Commission report highlights that by 2021, single parents and their children will lose a fifth of their income due to welfare reform. That's an average of £5,250 a year. And the predicted increase in child poverty rate after housing costs for children in single parent households is going to go up to 62%. So we're actually looking at how we're going to address a poverty-related attainment gap at a time when poverty is projected to increase. And I think that's one of the big challenges that we have. It's deepening as well as having, reaching more people and more and more people who are in work. So we do need to look at things like family-friendly working. We need to look at flexible childcare. There's a whole series of other policy areas which will impact on what we're trying to do here. Uh, convener. Um, a couple of sessions ago, um, uh, we were uh, debating not just the issues that you've spoken about uh, this morning, but about what can be very successful in terms of the teacher approach. Um, Danielle Mason from the uh, endowment group said that she felt that exactly what you said today were, were crucial, but that's not enough. What has to be added to this are very positive uh, teacher approaches. Could I ask Mrs Clooney if you could explain to us, in your experience, what are the best teacher approaches that help to at least explain to the youngsters some of the issues and barriers that they're facing and how they can address them? In terms of the teachers, um, we do a lot of work as a school that we try to have measures in every class to make sure there are no barriers. You know, if you need something, it's there, it's provided, there's, there's no questions asked. Um, but I think we go back to, to what Kirsten was saying and that you need happy families to get happy children. So. As a school, we started about three, four years ago, really looking into that uh, and trying to address things, which is where the summer club came from. Um, staff pop in, they don't have to be there, but they pop in and it's this informal chat over a cup of coffee where barriers between the parent and the teachers completely gone, you're on a level. People are sharing things that they would never normally have done, but because they have shared with them, we have to do something about it. So on a Monday, as you would have seen in my report, we have um, the blether, which is CBT. There's, there's no trees about it, it is, it's therapy. And we have two therapists who um, facilitate that meeting. But parents come and we chose a Monday deliberately because the weekend can be stressful. And parents have suggested other things that they would like to try. They've heard that yoga was beneficial. 
and it was for some of them, and it continues to be so, but some wanted something more active. So we got that going, and that's going on in the school. So my school's a very busy school for parents and children, and I think that helps because we're beginning to know the whole family, the holistic approach, as opposed to this wee bear that's in front of us. Um, but it is about making teachers who perhaps have never experienced this aware, um, but without the pity. You, know, you don't want that either. But it's just about, if you see a barrier, how can we reduce it as a grown-up and as the adult in the situation? What can we do to help and what can we do to get rid of that barrier? Uh, that's very helpful, Mrs Cleaning. Just in terms of what happens inside the classroom um, on key learning, could, would you be able to tell us some of the things that you feel have been very successful in helping those from disadvantaged backgrounds to do a bit better? Um, convener and one of my colleagues, uh, Ruth McGuire, we were in a school yesterday which had, I felt, some very good examples of what had helped actually in the classroom. Would you be able to tell at a primary level what you feel these things might be? When it comes to disadvantage, on paper, my school's one of the most disadvantaged in the the country, um, as, as you would have seen, we're at 94.7% of children in SIMD 1 and 2. And of the other 5.3, they're all in SIMD 1 and 2. They're just in houses that weren't there when the census. So what do we do? We support them whatever way we can. Um, obviously, last year, PEF was given to us. And as a school community, because it wasn't just the head teacher, it was the teachers, the children, the parents, we decided to upskill staff because we weren't sure how long this would continue and we didn't want to have things in place where it disappeared and, and you were back to square one. So we upskilled staff in various therapies so that we can offer um, children sessions at lunchtime and after school. It's things like Lego therapy, it's fun things, but it allows children to express how they're feeling. Um, another one was Castad, which is the combined use of sand trays, talking and drawing. But again, the children can opt into this um, if they are feeling stressed or distressed. We have increased the number of support for learning workers so that the teacher has a bit more time. We have put a lot of resources into P1. That's where we've really focused because we think if we get it right there, and we get the, the vocabulary up and we get children talking, then that will help as we go through. Um, obviously, we're into year two now of PEF, so we're continuing all of the above, but we're managing now, because now we're a wee bit more secure that we might be getting it for a little while, so we are looking at, um, we have quarriers coming in to work with children, parents and staff, and this year they're looking at um, first aid mental health. Um, we're hoping to get a homeschool worker, but I want to use my homeschool worker very differently to the, the model that Bernardo's used just now. And um, no, 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 it's Bernardo's that will host the person for me, but, but we have negotiated. I think it, we took Bernardo's way out of their comfort zone somewhat, but we've negotiated a completely different way of, because the parents have that relationship in school um, and with me, you know, so they'll come and I get helped sometimes to personal things, but that relationship's there. We need it differently, but we'll do whatever we can. We have to. Clarification on that point. It, what you've just uh, set out as these um, measures that you've taken, was that all covered by the PEF money? The ones I've just spoken about, mm. yes. yes Everything, definitely. including additional teachers. We didn't get any additional teachers. It was just upskilling. Upskilling the staff that okay. I have. Uh -huh. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tavish. I could just continue the same line of questioning to Liz, and, that, and that's just about how you judge success. And, and this, as Richard Lockett rightly said, is about attainment and achievement. Um, but you've given a very compelling series of examples of what you've done, particularly at P1. But ultimately, your P7 pupils are transitioning up to, to the high school that you feed to. Um, how do you judge, and this is, I guess I'm asking this not just about this year, but over a number of years, how do you judge success for your school in terms of 
uh, children who have come from this very tough but disrupted background as to how they then proceed into their secondary school education? Well, we've, we've looked at attendance. We've looked at inclusion. Um, we have reduced exclusions dramatically. Um, we're looking at parental engagement. We're looking at um, the children's engagement in other activities. And we feel if we get all of this right, then attainment should rise. Obviously, as a school, um, as head teacher, I meet with staff regularly, um, asking about individuals, asking about the class, monitoring where the children are, monitoring their progress, so those that are making good progress, why, and are we challenging those who are, are hiccuping, why, and what we're doing to support. That conversation goes on constantly. Mine is a large school, but it's not so large that I can't speak to every teacher every day. So people will come and say, oh, wait till I tell you a breakthrough with this child, or a wee bit concerned, so we can get in quickly. Um, and I, I think all of that. So we have, we're a data rich school. Um, if you saw my desk, you would realize we're a data rich school. We're maybe not very good at filing it, but we've got it. Um, when you say data rich, therefore you know the progression each pupil's making. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. The staff, I have very good staff. I am yeah. supported by a fabulous team, but we know exactly where the children are, what they're doing. We, um, and sorry, Liz, one person that we did manage to employ this year that has really helped is we've got CDO working in early years and she has a BA. She's a very highly skilled CDO and that has been a huge help for early years. You better say for the record what a CDO sorry, is. Sorry, in Glasgow, it's a child development Thank officer. You. Thank you. Um, I'm old, I would have said a nursery nurse. But, <laughs> um, <laughs> But that has been a huge benefit for early years and for that transition from nursery to primary. But for the rest of the school, you know, the staff are assessing daily. You, you assess minute by minute, you know, who's understanding. We actually had a delegation of Norwegian visitors on Friday, 26 of them, and I lost them my school. Um, it's quite spread out. I lost many of them. When we met at the door, they said, oh, we were in P7 and they were doing maths and we were saying, so what are you doing and why are you doing? And, you know, children could talk about their learning. I think they were quite surprised at the metacognition and the fact that the children really understood and, and different processes and strategies. So we know that the children are making progress, but I think all of the other things we do have certainly the fact that we've got them in school as well. You know, attendance is a huge thing if you're at absolutely, school. Absolutely. Then, then we've yeah. caught you. And you, you, you said a lot about children, but are parents making progress as well? Because I think you, you described the whole school very, very sensibly. Um, the biggest challenge, arguably, is about mum and dad as well, or mum or dad, or whatever the arrangements are. Do, 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 are these programmes working? You mentioned yoga earlier on. Do, do you find these programmes working? Dave had a go last week and said, Nancy, it's like Sucky Hall Street in here. And I said, no, it's not. We're busier than Sucky Hall Street. Um, we have, but again, it's come from parents. Um, so we have a photography class, but the, they work with Clyde College. But what they are now doing, that's some of our um, parents who have English as an additional language. They've not worked on the, the photographs, but now they're making the photographs into a dual language book their children will be doing the translation. We have a parent eco group where the food, sorry, is being now used um, in the lunch hall. We have, um, what else? Many of my parents we've put through certification and many have gone on to work. So we support the parents okay. as well as the children. The only other question I was going to ask is, are you doing this with other head teachers in across the Glasgow Authority? I mean, does Maureen McKenna ask you to go and mentor other head teachers in terms oh. of the things? <laughs> um, I, I'm fortunate that I've been seconded to, to help support this children's neighbourhood Scotland. Um, so obviously the approach, we're hope, not just the school, because children's neighbourhood is much more than schools but this kind of approach in others too.
Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Ross, you had a brief... Yes. Briefly, uh, you mentioned that one of the approaches you've taken is dramatically reducing um, exclusions. Is that that you've tackled the, the causes, uh, the, the behavioural causes or, or the other causes that have resulted in exclusion, or have you changed the school's policy and approach in how you respond to those issues and have chosen another approach than exclusion? A little bit of both. Um, my teachers are now much more aware of, of some of the stresses and challenges that some of the children face in their everyday lives and how that comes into school and that sometimes an angry child is only angry because they don't know how to express that they're sad or they're hurt or whatever. But with the, so many teachers being trained in different approaches, the child then is able to express himself a wee bit better. So we can say, I can see just now you're angry. Do you feel that you need to go and work with Mr. Such and Such or Miss Such and Such? And it's given the children a way out. And sometimes that half hour or hour to express themselves in sand or in Lego is enough to calm. Sometimes it's not, um, but it certainly has helped. So it's a little bit of both. It's changing how staff approach things, but also giving us the skills to deal with some children who are distressed. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Chelsea, you wanted to come in? Yeah, just um, two quick points. Uh, across our work at Children's Parliament, uh, the children speak often about the importance of relationships with school staff. And I think that's especially true for children who are living in circumstances where they're affected by poverty or trauma or stress. Um, one of the children who took part in this consultation says, you know, if you have a teacher who you trust, it's okay, but if you might feel stuck if you don't have anyone to tell. And so that kind of vital importance of having really positive relationships with teachers or school, other school staff and kind of helping with those circumstances and helping them achieve within their school day. So I think relationships are vital. Um, and where those are right, it really helps the children. And where those go wrong, it has a really negative impact on their experience at school and their, their attainment level. Um, and coming back to the program that we're doing in, in Aberdeen, um, we take a rights-based approach to that work. And we try to, working with, working with the schools and the class teachers to develop a culture of empathy and trust and kindness and one that's based on human dignity. And so I think helping children feel like they're part of that school community in that classroom and they're able to achieve within that setting. And the teachers who took part in this, this program spoke about the difference that it made in their understanding of that ch individual children and what works for them and how they can best support them in the classroom. Um, and also just on the kind of, on their learner self-perception and how the language that they use to describe their um, how they learn and what they're feeling. And so going, going back to the point that Nancy made about how important it is for children to have the right vocabulary to be able to express themselves. And so it's not just stuck at either I'm bored or I'm angry. Um, and they can get beyond that to really identify the issues and then be part of the solution, as Brian was saying earlier. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, Oliver. Thank you, uh, convener. I was going to ask, some of the previous evidence that we've heard in other su sessions has suggested that there's quite a wide variation from school to school, local authority to local authority, in terms of how uh, children uh, who are subject to poverty perform, um, and even where it's sort of like local authority for like local authority or like school for like school, there's, there's quite a difference. Do you think that the, the culture and leadership within the school is, is, the, is the most significant factor in explaining that, or is there more to it than that? Me. <laughs> um, I think the culture is, is a huge factor in that, absolutely. Um, I've been lucky, I've been in my current school for 10 years, so it wasn't an easy thing and it doesn't come overnight. It's about building trusts and um, relationships and for some of our families, we are the only stable thing in their lives. Um, so knowing that we are there and we're always there um, is really helpful for some staff and as I, uh, for some parents. And as I say, some parents are sharing concerns, worries way beyond their child and school um, because they come and they... If I don't know the answer, I'll know someone who knows someone who knows someone who knows the answer and it's just getting those supports in place. But it's a very time-consuming thing. Um, and as I said earlier, I'm fortunate to be backed by the most magnificent team that allow us to do that. Um, but it's, it's not always easy. Mm -hmm. 
Um, as I sit here and I listen to Nancy speak, I think it's fair to say that her school is exceptional. <laughs> um, and that, that there are an, a number of other <coughs> exceptional schools across the country, absolutely. Um, but there are also some schools where the starting point needs to be a bit further down the line, where we need to start the work that Nancy started 10 years ago. Um, and there we're looking at um, interventions which are about helping teachers to understand what trauma is. Um, we've got a fantastic trauma knowledge and skills framework in Scotland developed by NHS Education Scotland and we think that teachers should absolutely be accessing the training that's recommended in there so that they have the relevant level of knowledge to understand that that allows them to be um, more compassionate with students so not just looking at the behaviours but thinking about what is causing those behaviours to come um, and what support can we put in in those schools where the relationships are not great just now? Um, the reason that Nancy's had to push us out of our comfort zone is because often what we are doing is having that relationship and acting as that interface between the school and the parents. Um, and in some areas that is still needed. Um, in some, thankfully, it's not. That's great. Um, but in a lot of areas that needs to happen as well. So this issue of the culture and the ethos of the school, I think, is incredibly important. Um, and in many cases, I think it does come down to the leadership within that school. I have to say, I, I've talked about my school team, but my school team's much more than school staff. It's a health and social care partnership that I couldn't imagine not being in school. It's the thriving places, the community planning. Um, it's the third sector. We, we now no longer talk about partners. They're just friends of the school. And, and when, we come, when I come to do the school improvement planning, they're round the table because they very much support everything else that's going on. So this is not education in a silo. Um, it's supported by a range of, of services, statutory and third sector, that I just couldn't run the school without. Um, and I, I mean, I guess I, I hear you say you've been doing lots of these things for 10 years, and I guess the frustrating thing sort of sitting on, on this side of the table is why we haven't managed to sort of universally share that, that, that best practice. Um, how how do you think we we improve that? And you know, why why are other schools not taking up these initiatives? Is it a question of resources? Is it a question of of, of more training? I know you've upskilled your staff to to help them understand some of these issues. Do you think do you think that it's a, a, a sort of people are not aware of it, or do they not have the time or resource to to tackle it? I don't really want to speak on behalf of other people, I don't know, but um, as you'll have gathered, I'm not a shrinking violet, and so if I need help, I go out and I find, and, and over my journey of 10 years, I've been supported by, obviously, I've spoke about people locally, but so much more than that, people nationally, um, you know, what does it take to tweet someone to say, I really like what you're doing, have you got time and your busy schedule to come? And to get people like John Carnahan and Karen McCluskey into my school, knowing my parents, working with my children, um, you know, has been mind blowing and I'm now lucky enough to call them friends, but people of that calibre, but it's just been donning the brief pants, picking up the phone. What's the worst they can say to me as a wee go? Um, but nobody ever does. You know, they've always been really excited because they want to get in at ground level too. So it, it's been a wee bit cheeky and, and saying, can you come and help? I mean, you never know, it might be you next. Thanks, <laughs> Oliver. Um, <laughs> <laughs> can I ask you, Nancy, uh, you started 10 years ago other schools didn't. Why? I don't know. Um, I don't know if, obviously, personal journeys come into it. Um, I started my, I, I grew up in Gorbals. I started my teaching in Gorbals. And for those of you who know Glasgow, I'm now in Bridgeton, which is a stone's throw away. So I've almost completed the circle. Um, how I was brought up, my, my you know, the, the morals and the values that my parents gave me, that we were, we're all Jock Tamsin's bairns and that nobody's better than you and, and you can do whatever you want. And I really believe that of the children and I'll say that to them, you know, you can be anything you want, anything. And I'm there to get you there and help you. And you, know, you see the wee shoulders going, 
recognise at a time when others weren't that it was a community, that, that sort of village that makes a child, that, that, uh, when, when other schools weren't going down that route? I mean, what was it that you saw that others didn't and why didn't? Well, I suppose when, when I got the school I'm in just now, um, I'd like to think that the two schools I was head of before I did the same, but the school that I took on 10 years ago was five small schools that closed and became a new school. The merger had happened and then I arrived. And the communities, um, for all, they're only across roads from each other, were very f proud communities with um, lots of local history. Went into the school, didn't know which child had come from which community, but by golly, I knew that's one staff there and that's one staff there. So it had to be this united front. We were quite fortunate, it was two. 2007, August 2007, I started, and we knew that in November the Commonwealth Games was going to be announced. We took the, I took the gamble that Glasgow would get it, and we knew that if Glasgow got it, the Commonwealth Village would be built in our community, so that we knew that there were changes. So it was new head, new broom, had to come up with something that they had never heard of before, that no one could say, oh, well, you know, in this school, we did it like that. So it was just, let's get going. Come on, let's be different. Um, at that point, although ACs were around, I had never heard of it, but I knew that all these things impacted on children. I never heard of adverse um, childhood experiences, but we started looking at things and we had to build a community because the parents were, for all the parents lived close, they didn't know each other, so we had to bring it together, and, and that was the focus so of the school. You were to get yep. in, in the ground. Okay, uh, thanks very much for that, Brian. And the yeah, yeah, from my experience, I've uh, been on parent councils, and s schools where there's uh, programmes in place, it sometimes doesn't take an awful lot to start unravelling where an incident can happen like that. A head teacher moves on for whatever reason, and the new head teacher that comes in maybe can't get to grips with the problem, so that head teacher moves on. And there's no continuity there, and you can start to see through that the programme's unravelling because there's no one kind of at the head of the ship to keep things going. Also, trying to get parental involvement, that's very important, I found, Nancy. Uh, some schools that I've had experience of, it's very difficult to get parental involvement, especially when there's distinct, if you like, the, uh, cultures within the school where you may have a large immigrant community again, and the communities don't understand each other, and it's trying to bring them all together. Where you do get parental involvement, and the things are, are not easy, but they're... they're slightly easier to put into place because you've got the parent the parents who want to drive things forward and it's trying to keep that going i don't know how you find nancy where my experience was it was always a, a small core group of parents that wanted to really get involved but as the children move up through the school and the, the children move on to secondary education those parents move on as well and it's trying to keep that going, they bring in the next set of parents who are going to kind of run with the flag. Tell me what you're saying, Brian, but the, I mean, what we, I, th I think my colleagues will agree with me, but we found uh, uh, in any evidence we've had about parental engagement is that it's not been immigrant com communities, for example, that's been difficult. It's been the, 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 the previously bad experiences of school by parents have made it more difficult. And I mean, the, one of the things that stands out is Domanic. I would suspect, and I know the area very well, would have a lot of parents who had poor experiences at school. So, I mean, you're telling us that you've managed to turn that round. I suppose the answer that the, this committee is looking for is how? And, and that's something... I've got a lot of friend, head teacher friends who ask the same people who will say, Do you know, we've started a homework club and we've got three coming and you get 120. But my answer is always, have you asked your parents what they want? We've never produced something or offered something that hasn't come from something a parent has said. It's been led by parents. Um, 
so we only need a spark and um, just in January, I had two parents in first day back saying, Nancy, had a thought about summer school. I don't actually know what to do if, you know, in terms of first aid. Could we get something in summer for that? And someone else had a near miss with a fire and said, I'd quite like to know. So we've got fire training running for parents. But it comes from things parents have said. Funnily enough, the one thing I can't get is a parent council. I haven't got a parent council. That's weird. That's weird. Um, but it's I, about empowerment of the parents, I think, is, <laughs> is the real answer to your question, isn't it? I, and I think, yeah, complete yeah. involvement and empowerment, absolutely. Chelsea? Um, I just wanted to go back to something that Nancy was saying earlier about kind of opportunities for schools and inviting different organisations in or people to come in and kind of, yeah, to broaden what's happening in that school. And I think for Children's Parliament, we work with schools across Scotland every year and for our consultations and projects, some schools are kind of so eager to get involved and they're really keen for us to come in and deliver workshops or sessions or projects. And there are other schools that are very re resistant to that or they don't have the capacity to even think about doing that. And so I think there's a huge discrepancy between schools about how they approach those additional opportunities that present for them. Um, so I think there's something to be said about an attitude of, you know, yes, let's get this going and trying new things. But there's also some a capacity issue as well, I think, for some schools, or they might just be resistant to people coming in who they don't know. Um, and the second thing I wanted to, to say is that in some of our MCPs attended the second cabinet meeting with uh, children and young people in March. And one of the things that they continuously say is that they want to be more involved in teacher training, in social work training, so that those people who are going on to be in those professions are hearing from children um, early on in their training about what makes a good relationship between pupils and, and, and student, or teachers, and also kind of what makes those relationships work and what, they, what their advice is for those people. They have a lot of experience with teachers and social workers, and we, we should be using them um, to help our, our professionals as they advance in their careers. And so that's something that I just echo here, um, is that children are saying that they want to be involved in that. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Jolene? So many things that I wanted to pick up have already been mentioned by you, but particularly um, just off the back of your talk about ACEs and what you've just said about teacher training. Do you think that there is a role for the teacher training that, that, that new teachers are going through where actually they have got that fundamental basic training in the sort of things that you're now using your PEF funding for, for your continuing pre professional development in your schools, which um, give them the, the toolkits, the basic toolkits to be able to understand childhood trauma and the impact of that and how they can, they can help? feelings on this. I know that Bernardos are very keen. Um, for many people, teacher training is now one year. So it's a very, very tight year and there's so much to cram in. I also don't think children should be labelled with ACEs. Many children have suffered many um, trauma, but some have the resilience and, and we as teachers can help other children build that resilience. I think it's very important they know about it, but there's so many other things to cram into a very tight year that it's a very difficult one. Um, I'm, I've been very fortunate. I've had some amazing young teachers come through my hands, but they come into schools a wee bit like rabbits caught in headlights because that year has passed and I was. The people who have gone through four years, obviously they've got more time to think about it and consider but I, I'm unsure about how much time can be spent on anything. And, and if you only mention it and it's piecemeal, is that worse? I don't know. And I think maybe it's up to the schools to work. I mean, we talk about it, but there's no labelling of children um, who have suffered the three, four, five, six, even seven ACEs. But I know that that's different from Bernardo's. What, Absolutely, we would take on board the additional pressures that are being put onto teachers and so it's less that we would say this is the method by which teachers need to understand about trauma and ACEs um, because there will be others who are better placed to, to make those decisions but there are a couple of things that I think would really help. One is going back to what we talked about, about the culture of leadership within a school um, and there's the new um, qualifications and um, training <coughs> for head teachers. I think it's incredibly important that trauma and ACEs are there because that leadership and that understanding and needs to come from the very top of the school um, and that will help to change that th those cultural issues that we've talked about. 
The approach that we take at the moment um, in supporting teachers is often around helping them with an individual case that they are facing at that time, and that then helping them to, under, to, to broaden their understanding of ACEs and of trauma without it being prescriptive or in a textbook or an additional thing that they feel, oh, I've got to take this on, but where they can really see the benefit. So, for example, um, we had a case in a school of a, a young man who would often take himself out of the classroom. He found that just really stressful to be in that environment, and he would take himself off to a nurture space within the school. And the teacher would send somebody to bring him back. Um, so that young man was in no position to learn at that point. So in terms of attainment, it's not doing him any favours. You've brought him back to the classroom, but you've made him more angry. So we've helped that, that teacher to understand that actually the reason he takes himself there is to calm himself down. That helps him to regulate his own emotions. Then when he's ready to come back, he'll be in a position to learn. So it's not so much saying you must know about this new thing and you must know this terminology, but it's about saying, can we help you to unpick that now so that if it happens again in the future, you'll be better placed to deal more compassionately with that person rather than just looking at their behaviours. Um, and I, would, I think from our perspective as well, I think the, in creating that culture that supports children in school and at home, um, I think children's rights are vital to that. Um, and as I, I think, I hope many of you have seen the documentary Resilience, which is where a lot of the discussion around ACEs has come from in Scotland. Um, as I was watching that, it struck me as the kind of gap in the, in the narrative of that film, because it's an American film where they don't talk about children's rights like we do here. And I think it was something that can really support what we do in Scotland as a foundation, because those 10 things that are identified as adverse childhood experiences are, are happening because children's rights aren't being fulfilled. Um, so I think creating a culture where children's rights are respected, where children and adults know about their rights can help us address some of these issues that come to the front. And one of the, the MCPs that we worked with said, I think, it's more, it's, I think more people in Scotland, especially kids, need to know about their rights. If something unfair happens, then they know what to do about it. So it gives children an understanding of what should be happening, what shouldn't be happening, and that there are people that they can go to to discuss what's happening in their lives. Yeah. Uh, I'm just going to quickly add to that to say, I do think it's important for us to look at how we have better trauma-informed practice across all the professions um, that work with, with children. Um, I, but I also think it's important for that to be contextualised. And when we're talking about um, adverse childhood experiences, I mean, our, our view at OPFS is that that needs to take place with an anti-poverty framework, which recognises the structural causes of inequality. So you can actually be extremely resilient. You can be coping with a series of knockbacks day after day after day but there's only so much you yourself can do to address those and there are other factors that we need to look at. And I think with poverty in particular, which is what we're talking about here, it can exacerbate the impact of those adverse experiences on individuals and families because it, it reduces your ability to put in place those protective and remedial factors, which actually, you know, you could be in an upper class uh, upper middle class family, have a series of ACEs, but that family has got a resource to be able to buy in what they need to support you with that. So I think it's looking at the impact of poverty um, on the capacity and resources to deal with the effects of adverse childhood experiences at the same time as recognising that many of these families have developed a high degree of resilience and coping mechanisms and are pu putting up with circumstances on a daily basis which are having an impact and we need to look at contextualising this whole debate um, within the anti-poverty debate. Thank you. Julie? Yeah, I'd just like to ask about PEF funding. And obviously you've outlined some incredible things that you're doing with your particular PEF funding. And it was really good to hear that you don't make that decision yourself. You make that decision. The school community makes that, that decision. Um, is there any um, things that you would like to sort of use this opportunity to talk about um, PEF funding, what it means to a school? What maybe if, if it can be improved? You mentioned about knowing that you're going to be getting it year on year. Is there anything that you would say that uh, that PEF has meant to your school that otherwise you it wouldn't have had, to? I mean, last year it came as a, a complete bolt out the blue, and to be given the third largest amount in the whole of Scotland um, was scary. No two ways about it. But you very quickly get used to it. Um, and this year it went up significantly, so we have we have a lot of money. But it is exciting, and we are trying to make use of it well, so that 
I, we, not just I can document, that we can document that it's helping to close the gap and raise attainment. Um, it would, I appreciate that we can't say it's for 10 years or whatever, but knowing you know, this uncertainty that is it next year, are we getting it? It, it would be helpful, that, that's for sure. But um, it, is, it has been very gratefully received. I was in Finland last week with teachers from all over Scotland, and of course it was mentioned. And it was really interesting hearing what they're doing and learning from each other. It really has allowed us to be quite creative and, and um, think out the box. And I think that's, that's a wonderful challenge as a leader to, to not just do more of the same. If you do more of the same, you get more of the same at the end. So really thinking differently. It's been super. So thank you okay. to everyone who voted for it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and just finally, before I let one of my colleagues uh, come in, um, I am struck by what you're saying about the parental engagement in your schools, but I am very aware that, for, as, as James alluded to earlier, that for some parents, maybe with very chaotic lifestyles, or parents who have had a very negative experience of school themselves, that to actually getting involved in the school could be an, an added pressure. And if, if they feel that they're, they're, they're outside that, that whole community, how, how do you deal with parents like that for whom the idea of coming into a school is another stressor onto their already very chaotic or busy life that they feel that they just can't engage with the school. Well, that's what I'm wanting to, to explore next because we have the parents who are very keen to be part. We have parents who have been reluctant because of language barriers and we've got them on board, but we do have some parents that we're not getting. Um, so we want to know what, what we, the one thing that they will come to is anything to do with their children. The turnout at my parents' evenings last month was 98%, which I think is tremendous. Mm -hmm. And of the 2% who didn't come, every one of them called. Every single child was accounted for. So the, my parents really do want their children to do well, but there are some who haven't joined things yet. So what is it that that would get you in, and we need to explore that. But we need to ask them. And if that means knocking on doors, then that's what we do. You know, if you won't come to a coffee morning, then I come to you. There's no escape. So, but we need to ask, because I don't know what the answer is. Um, I'm looking for, for my parents to tell me. And Tactics in. I'm the mafia, <laughs> the Bridgeton mafia. <laughs> Okay. Uh, right. Thank, thanks, Julian. Uh, Mary, you wanted to come in with that? So, just a very brief follow-up question on PEF. What would you be able to do differently with your PEF funding if you knew year on year you were getting that funding? If you knew for the next 10 years you were going to get the same amount of funding, what would you do differently? I think it would allow us to write a long-term action plan. Um, just now it's reactionary. You know, we've got the money. Fortunately, we were allowed to carry it forward, and that was a huge help, anything that we didn't spend. But just now, it's reactionary. It would be really nice to sit and say, let's, let's vision 10 years' time, where would we like to be, and have a theory of change going. Just now, um, it's happening quickly, and I, I'd like to take more time and, and think deeper and longer. To rather Absolutely. Than reactive. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hey, Kirsten, you wanted to come out? Uh, yeah, the, the other issue around long and short term funding is around the importance of relationships, which we've talked about. And if the funding is only for one year, um, if we are commissioned in by a school, it's very difficult to retain staff um, on that short term contract and therefore for those relationships to blossom. And families feel really let down when their worker changes. Something like that can have a real impact and set your, your, your right back. So that would be the other advantage of the long term funding. Okay, thank you. Ruth? Thanks, Convener. Good morning, panel, or good afternoon, as it is now. <laughs> um, it's been a really interesting um, session, and my colleagues have covered a, a fair bit of the ground. I wanted to talk about um, collaboration um, with you all, and I think that we know intuitively, as well as um, with the evidence that we've gathered, that um, tackling the attainment gaps more than just about school it has to involve parents and the, and the community and, indeed, third sector organisations. Um, in terms of um, the PEF 
funding and the attainment challenge? Are there any changes that need to happen to it to make collaboration easier? Um, What's making me ask this is that we heard in evidence here in the committee and also on the visit we did to the school yesterday that procurement can be a bit of an issue. And I know it's not a hugely exciting topic, procurement, but do you have the flexibility to bring in other services to get the things you need? Are there any barriers to doing that? As person with PEF, I haven't found any barriers um, yet. Um, maybe I haven't been exciting and... But I, I haven't found any problems. Anything that I've wanted to do, I've managed to do. Um, no, I haven't found that. I suppose it from yourself. From I, I, I wonder whether the Nancy factor comes into play here again in that you are the person who will go out and knock on doors because I think that the feedback that we've had um, is that for third sector organisations we are now having to um, engage individually with individual schools and it's very difficult for us, it's very challenging for us to develop those relationships with schools which is not the way that we've traditionally operated. Um, so something structural which makes it easier for schools to know what is out there and what is available because Nancy has the drive, she knows what it is she wants to achieve, she goes out and she finds somebody to help with that. But I think there are other head teachers who felt more overwhelmed by having that money, who are not so sure about what it is that they could usefully do with it. And so ways in which we can do that that isn't on a, an individual relationship basis um, would be really helpful. Sorry, I hadn't thought of that, Kirsten. Um, certainly at a head teacher's meeting, a new head teacher ex said exactly that. I don't know what is out there. So we, um, Glasgow City Council organised speed dating for third sectors and, and um, charities, but they were all there. You could go round, you could speak, you could pick up leaflets, and that was very helpful for people who didn't know where they were going. Um, I appreciate that some smaller authorities or, or um, remote communities, that would be a wee bit harder, but it's certainly, I know that new head teachers in Glasgow found it very helpful. Sorry, Brian. That's good. One of the things that was fed back to me from a parent who, was in a, who is in a parent council is the accountability by the head teacher and the reason why that was raised was, it's going back to kids who don't have access to after schools clubs due to transport issues where they were trying to put in a homework club within the school, which would be great, but it's not helping the kids. It's aimed at because you've got the transport issues and trying to get them to bring in the, the homework clubs to the areas where the kids stay, because uh, there's facilities there. So the, this person raised the accountabilities that they can, that it's great the money's there, but the, the, the ability of the parent council to maybe say, cooperate, maybe coordinate, and put in their ideas. Where the parents haven't been collaborated with mm. effectively, rather than other yeah. around you. Okay. Right. Thank you, Ruth. Uh, and finally, Joanne. Okay. Um, thanks very much. I think it's been really interesting. I'm, I'm sensing perhaps the committee is going to suggest we should just clone. Nancy Clooney and, and everything would be solved. To say. But um, I mean, I, I think I would. I mean, that's been really interesting, and also that m much of what you've described predates. You, the PEF is now facilitating something you were already doing. I think I would also say that in my experience over the years, I'm privileged of being an elected member. There are quite a lot of Nancy Clooney's kicking about in the in primary school sector, particularly who are full of energy and full of ideas. And I suppose what our job in, as part is to think about how do we use all those resources in our schools best in order to focus on this gap that we're all concerned about. I'm interested in, I think you've made a very good, um, you've been able to explain very clearly how you've seen, you've seen the opportunity of PEF. A lot of the evidence we've had over the last period has suggested that education is under a lot of pressure Schools are under a lot of pressure, staff are under a lot of pressure. There's been a loss of support staff that would support the school and facilitate with its attendance officers, uh, admin staff, and certainly my direct experience of speaking to teachers, they describe their increased workload because all that support staff has gone. Has that been your experience? Um, and has there been a loss of, for example, properly supported learning support, support workers that you're now perhaps finding ways of funding through PEF? 
I haven't found um, a loss without funding, without personal funding through PEF, our, our support workers have increased significantly. Um, there has been, in things like educational psychologists, their numbers have reduced, but I think the approach that we're now taking where we work collaboratively with other schools and the, the psychological services through um, SIMS, staged intervention meetings, and through joint support team meetings, they've been very helpful because it allows different people to, to contribute. Um, I think it's thinking out the box. You know, money isn't limitless. Um, we have to make best use of what we've got. I think the establishment in my own authority of local improvement groups, where I'm working with four other head teachers very closely on PEF, what they're doing, how it's affecting their attainment. They hear about mine and we're learning from each other. I think we have to be really creative. Um, and. I, we have to stop moaning and just go on with it. You know, we've got what we've got. Let's make best possible use of it and um, make sure every, everything we've got, every person, every resource, be it physical, um, monetary or, or people, that we're using it to get the best for our young people. So there would be no distinction for you between, for example, your core funding been stable and increasing, as opposed to PEF funding, you just simply, you use the money, whatever money you get, in whatever means you get. I have tried to, I have not used PEF funding for anything that should come from the school budget. And my school budget is such that I've been able to do many a thing. PEF has been extra, um, and I, I'm making that very clear. And when people say, can we get this, can we get this? Well, we look at the budget first, if it's something that should be in school. Um, and that PEF is to make a difference to, you know, I don't want, I don't want the two merged. I, I want to keep them quite clear. But the school budget certainly covers what it should be covering. And PEF has allowed us to do things like residential trips, which had stopped for my school because it was coming down to a few. So this year we had 56 away for a week. And these are the kind of weeks that children never forget. So it's about building memories. Ask on, on that point then, because I mean, even way back in the day when I was still a school teacher, there was ways and means that you found without stigmatising a family to ensure that they were able to participate. Um, and you would know, probably, if you know the families well, you would know how to do that. And that's part of the skill, I think, of, of a well-run school, if you can support them without having to deny them things. Does that mean that that, that that trip thing at the end of Primary 7 is so important? Do you think there are enough means by which we can ensure that all of our young people in Primary 7 are able to get to go to that kind of, of trip? Because it is about their educational experience as well as everything else. Or... Does the PEF funding absolutely fit that then? Is that a good example of how you would allow everybody in a school to go on such a trip? I was quite clear as soon as we heard PEF um, with my deputies before we had consulted with anyone, our eyes lit up and we said straight away, that's a residential. So over the years, when I first went to the school, we did have it and most children went, but over the years, the numbers were dwindling and no amount of, of subsidising, but but they're still expensive. So um, we decided it was easier not to have them than to have seven, eight, ten, or whatever go. But this year, to be able to say to everyone, um, I did charge everyone £10, because I don't think you should get things for nothing. And I think that's, that's something that's really important. You said earlier about the swap shop for clothes, putting in a donation. I think you have to give people their pride. So... We gave them a year's warning. It was £10, um, and they could pay it up. And everyone who wanted to go went. Now, some children didn't come, but that was for other reasons, that they weren't yet mature enough, or, or they didn't want to come. But um, the PEF money allowed us to take the children away. Um, and as I say, I think it, we did it in January, because we want to benefit as well as a school. Um, and it's also a little bit cheaper, so it was less of our PEF money. But I think it's really important that it gets used for things like that. 
Thank you very much, Ryan. Uh, can I say thank you very much? That was a, that's the end of this session. That was a fantastic panel, and I think everybody here got a, a great deal about it. And uh, Nancy, can you empty your diaries for Wednesdays, and we'll see you here at ten o'clock every Wednesday morning. Okay. But seriously, thank you to everybody. That was that was tremendous. That brings us to the end of the public part of the meeting, and we'll now move into private session. I shall suspend for a moment or two to allow the witnesses and the gallery to leave before continuing.